I'm talking about science set free. And what science is being set free from is the science delusion. The science delusion is the belief that science has already understood the nature of reality in principle, leaving only the details to be filled in. This is very widely believed in our society. It's one of the reasons for the dogmatism that all of us encounter, um, which is so annoying, but it's because people think they already know the truth. They sincerely believe that, um, and this is probably one of the most widespread delusions uh, in our society, and we've now exported it to the rest of the world. There's a conflict in the heart of science between science as a method of inquiry about the testing of hypotheses, looking at the evidence, finding out what's really going on, open-minded, uh, subject to correction, and so forth. The ideal of science, which many people uh, think of as what science is. Now, it's what science ought to be, and I agree with that ideal. The reality, as many of us have encountered uh, through bitter experience, is rather different. For many people, science has become a belief system, a world view. This is sometimes called scientism, where people take the dogmas of science to be a kind of religious belief system or quasi-religious belief system. And it's this dogmatic belief system which I think is now constricting and holding science back in a very serious way. In almost every branch of science, we see the law of diminishing returns. More expensive research yields fewer and fewer really new results. And I think the reason for all that is this dogmatic belief system. If science can be set free from it, uh, new experiments and new possibilities open up in every area. What I do in my book, Science Set Free, is take the ten dogmas of institutional science, which are part of the scientific worldview, and turn these dogmas into questions, treat them not as beliefs or truths, but as hypotheses that can be tested against the evidence. I then look at them scientifically to see how well they stack up uh, when you take into account the evidence, none of them do. And in every case, new possibilities open up. Uh, science becomes, would, uh, would become regenerated uh, when we undergo this process. I don't have time to discuss all ten dogmas today, but what I'll do first is just say what they are. Um, <clears throat> and first and foremost, dogma one is the belief that nature is mechanical or machine-like. This has been the foundational principle of science since uh, the beginning of modern science in the 17th century. Mechanistic science is based on the machine metaphor. Nature is a machine. Stars are machines. Animals and plants are machines. Uh, that's why you can have industrial agriculture, genetic engineering, factory farming, and so on. They're just machines. And we're machines too, lumbering robots, in Richard Dawkins' vivid phrase, with brains that are genetically programmed computers. The second dogma is the total amount of matter and energy is always the same, uh, except at the moment of the Big Bang when it all appeared from nowhere. Um, that's, uh, then the third dogma is similar to that, the laws of nature are fixed. The laws and constants of the world are the same today as they were at the moment of the Big Bang, uh, when they all suddenly appeared like a kind of cosmic Napoleonic code. As Terence McKenna used to say, uh, modern science is based on the principle, give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. <laughs> and <clears throat> the one free miracle is the appearance of all the matter and energy in the universe and all the laws that govern it from nothing in a single instant. The uh, fourth dogma, uh, is that matter is unconscious. The universe is made up of totally unconscious matter. Fifth, nature is purposeless. There are no purposes in nature and um, the evolutionary process has no purpose or direction. Sixth, biological inheritance is material. It's genetic in the genetic material DNA or possibly in epigenetic modifications of the DNA, which are also chemical, or in cytoplasmic inheritance, but at any rate, it's all material. Seven, memories are stored as material traces inside the brain. Everything you remember is somewhere inside your head as a stored memory, either in phosphorylated proteins, modified synapses, or some material form which has not yet been fully identified. Uh, they, so the details are very vague, 
uh, attempts to find these traces have failed over and over again, but nevertheless, it's universally believed within neuroscience that they're all inside the brain. Uh, dogma eight, the mind is inside the head. Mental activity is brain activity. Uh, your mind is nothing but uh, what goes on in your brain. Dogma nine follows from dogma eight, psychic phenomena are illusory um, things like telepathy can't really happen because they would imply the mind can work at a distance from the body and it can't do that because it's all inside the head. And dogma 10, mechanistic medicine is the only kind that really works. Alternative and complementary therapies may appear to work but that's only because people would have got better anyway or it's all the placebo effect. But the real kind, the only kind that really works is mechanistic medicine which is why in most parts of the world, it's the only kind taught in medical schools, it's the only kind funded by uh, government funding agencies, and so on. Well, these are the ten beliefs which are more or less the default belief system of most scientists and, and most educated people today. Wherever they are in the world, in India or China or wherever, this is the belief system which is predominant. Now, within science itself, of course, people at the leading edge of research in many ways have moved beyond this belief system. Research scientists are not necessarily committed to this in every detail, but they're usually only at the frontier of one region. A, a, a physicist might be at the frontiers of cosmology and have gone beyond some of these dogmas of physics, but that, they wouldn't question the dogmas of psychology or biology. Those would remain more or less intact. So there are various people who question bits of it, uh, but uh, there's very little that's been done to question the whole thing. This is essentially the materialist world view. And uh, it became the dominant view of science in the 19th century. Uh, science was, as it were, hijacked by materialist philosophy and since then has been a wholly owned subsidiary of materialism. There's re no reason why society, science has to be materialist. It wasn't materialist before the 19th century. It was dualist, as I'll say soon. And I think we can go beyond that uh, to a new, more inclusive, more organic, uh, organismic paradigm for science. What I'm going to do first is look at the dogma that the total amount of matter and energy is always the same. This got built into the foundations of science in the 17th century. Um, it was not brought about by incredibly detailed observations using nanogram balances and so forth. It came about for purely philosophical or rather theological reasons. The founding fathers of modern science were all uh, Christians who believed that the world was a machine, that God was a machine maker, an engineering, mathematically minded God who'd created the world machine. And he'd started off the world machine in the first place <coughs> um, by creating the matter that's in it, which he created in the form of atoms, taking the idea from Greek atomism. And these atoms, by definition, couldn't be destroyed. They couldn't be broken up. So once God had created them, the total amount of atoms or matter must automatically remain the same forever. And God also endowed the universe with a certain quantum of movement or force, uh, which started it in motion. And thereafter, because this God-given force couldn't be changed by anything else, uh, the amount remained the same. So the principles of conservation of matter and energy were built into science from the outset, um, not on the basis of detailed measurements. They've served as useful accountancy principles ever since, but they were formulated more rigorously in the mid-19th century in the law of conservation of matter and energy uh, and in the first law of, cons uh, of thermodynamics. <clears throat> so it was assumed that that was the end of the matter and that they were fixed forever. And most people take that for granted today. They've learned it in high school and they see, never see any reason to question it. This was the dogma of science which I myself didn't question until quite recently. I'd questioned all the others, but it was only when I was writing this book that I thought I should look at this one. Um, and I actually rather wanted it to turn out to be true because I thought if I... Uh, said that all ten dogmas of science were false, it might sound a bit biased. So I thought it'd be quite nice if one of them held up, and I thought this was the best candidate. Um, but when I thought about it, it turned out to be a, a shambles. Um, first of all, physicists are above the law, 
and they've found themselves quite free to invent or hypothesize forms of matter and energy that which no one had ever thought of before. One of them is, of course, dark matter. Observations of galaxies and the way that stars moved within them, and also the ways that galaxies interact with each other, suggested that the galaxies, if they were to be explained in terms of gravitation, uh, simply wouldn't work. Uh, the, the whole thing simply didn't work. So in order to make it work, they hypothesized there was extra matter, uh, which you can't see, hence the name dark matter, uh, that uh, accounted for all the phenomena of galaxies and their interactions. Well, how much dark matter was there? Well, simple. Just invent the exact amount you need to explain the observed phenomena. Uh, you can titrate the amount of dark matter at will uh, to uh, explain the phenomena you're trying to explain. If you find new phenomena, peculiar bulges in galaxies or something that uh, 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 one size fits all dark matter won't explain, then you add a bit more where it's needed. The system works perfectly and you can explain everything with complete accuracy uh, because you can change the amount at, at will. Um, the only trouble is no one knows what it is and there's no independent evidence for it. People have been speculating about its nature ever since it was first postulated. Um, having created all this extra matter in the universe, uh, then this meant there should be more gravitation and physicists expected in the 1990s that the universal expansion from the Big Bang would slow down. Uh, the universe would stop expanding, then be begin to contract under the influence of all this gravitational matter uh, until it ended in tears in the reverse of the Big Bang uh, known in the trade as the Big Crunch. So, um, this, uh, the, uh, when in the late 1990s people observed that the universe appeared to be accelerating because of red shifts in distant quasars and so on, and galaxies, um, uh, then there was the problem, how do you explain this acceleration? Well, the answer was ready to hand, a new form of energy no one had known about before, uh, which caused the universe to expand. How much is there? Well, just the right amount to explain the facts. Uh, so we now have dark matter and dark energy uh, as huge amount of the universe. They currently make up about 96% of reality. Now, physicists have invented something like 20 times more energy and matter than anyone had ever heard of till the 1980s. And no one's uh, said, oh, you can't do that. It's defying the law of conservation of matter and energy. And if you ask, is all this matter and energy conserved, is the total amount always the same? Well, for dark matter, nobody knows. For dark energy, the most usual theory is that actually the amount's increasing. As the universe expands, there's more dark energy. The universe is now a perpetual motion machine. So the idea it's all rigorously conserved doesn't really make much sense in those terms. There's also, the, within uh, quantum physics, uh, uh, zero-point energy, uh, a form of uh, energy which is supposed to be there underlying the world we live in, which is like waves on an ocean of energy. Um, and there's huge amounts of it. The amount in a teaspoon would be enough to power the United States for years. Um, not surprisingly, some people claim that they can tap this energy and have devices which uh, tap unconventional or unknown forms of energy, including zero-point energy. Um, if you go online, you'll find there are many people who claim to have above unity devices, machines that produce more energy than you put into them. Well, these are immediately banned from regular science because they violate the first of science's taboos established by Galileo in the early 17th century, the taboo against perpetual motion machines. This taboo long predated the laws of thermodynamics, uh, and it's one of the most deep-seated taboos in science. So things like cold fusion or uh, above unity devices or free energy devices, whether they're based on zero point energy or peculiar electromagnetic effects or parametric resonance or the various other theories that are used to explain them are totally beyond the pale. 